Well, we've seen the kids come in and bring the palms and put them on the altar, and we know it's Palm Sunday, but traditionally we don't just look at this Sunday as only Palm Sunday, but it also begins the Passion of Holy Week. And so I want us to hear another part of the Gospel writer Matthew's story, particularly of when Jesus, he's, he's entered the city and he's been held as a king. But now he knows what awaits him. And so he goes to a garden called Gethsemane. And there he asks his disciples to go with him and he just asks one thing of those disciples. But they can't fulfill it. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. We're going to read parts of the story starting in chapter 26 here, and we're going to start in verse 36. And then Jesus went with them, the disciples, to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I'm deeply hurt, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. And then he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me just one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, Jesus went away for a second time and prayed, my Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, Jesus came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy. And so leaving them again, he went away and he prayed for a third time, saying the same words. And then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's be on our way. My betrayer is at hand. And while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and from the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I kiss will be the man. Arrest him. And at once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And Jesus looked at him and said, Friend, why are you here? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus, and they arrested him. The word of God today for the people of God. Thanks. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we pray this day that your word may be our word, that your heart may be our heart, and that your feet and hands may be our feet and hands. And now, Lord, may the words of all of our mouths and even the meditations of each one of our hearts, may they truly be acceptable in your sight. For you and you alone, Lord, you are our strength and you are our Redeemer. Amen. This past Thursday, I left Highlands a little early. I was going to Andrews to see my great aunt. A hundred and five and three quarters. She'll be a hundred and six in August. My great aunt Jean. Now, I've told you about her before. She was a school teacher and She's bankrupt the state of North Carolina because I promise you they did not count on her living this long in retirement. 
She'd been having a little trouble lately, though. She had some gallbladder trouble about a, about a month ago when they took her to the hospital in Murphy. And she was in Murphy for about a week. And if you live in Andrews, North Carolina, you don't really want to go to Murphy, North Carolina. And if you live in Murphy, you don't want to go to Andrews. And so the whole time Aunt Jean was in the hospital there, she said, I want to get out. Well, they decided probably surgery was going to be the best bet, but there were no surgeons that had ever done surgery on a 105-year-old in Murphy. And so they sent her to Asheville. She was in Asheville about two weeks, and a surgeon there did do surgery on her and relieved her pain, and, and, and Aunt Jean was feeling so good. Now, she had lived by herself up until the time she went in the hospital in Murphy. But the surgeon who had his picture made with my Aunt Jean because he said, nobody will ever believe this. <laughs> he told my Aunt Jean she was going to have to go into a nursing home. And so they took her back to Andrews and she was miserable. She was becoming non-responsive and all she said was, I want to go home. She's 105 years old. And so last Monday, Aunt Jean went home. Non-responsive in the nursing home, not walking, not getting up. Tuesday morning, after she spent the night in her bed, she got up, put her clothes on, went to the breakfast table, ate two eggs, three slices of bacon, and a piece of toast. <laughs> it was my time Thursday to go check on her. And so I got there about 8.30 and I walked into the door of, of, of her house there in Andrews and I just flung the door open and I said, Aunt Jean, your favorite great nephew is here. She's 105, she doesn't hear real well. <laughs> Nobody said anything. And so I walked on in and she's in the kitchen again. Eating eggs and eating bacon, drinking coffee. And she looked up and she saw me, and here's the quote from my 105-year-old great aunt. Well, looky there, the devil himself has come. <laughs> it's the quote. I said, yeah, you're still the meanest woman in the world. We really do love each other. But. Then, I, then I sat down and we just started talking a little. And she looked at me and she said, do you have a preacher's meeting in Murphy today? I said, no, ma'am. What, what are you doing here, Paul? Well, Aunt Jean, I came to see you, to check on you. And, and she goes, no, really. Well, what are you doing here? Jesus was in a garden called Gethsemane. You heard the story. He, he took with him some of his disciples and he asked them to do one thing, to stay awake. Jesus knows what's going to await him. But the disciples, they can't even do that. And Jesus says, come on, get up. My time is at hand. You know the story. Judas sold him out for some money. And Judas had given the guards and, and the church of Jesus' day. He said, I tell you what, the one I kiss, that's the one you arrest. Because they weren't really sure who Jesus was. And so Judas goes up and kisses Jesus on the cheek. And did you hear what Jesus said to him? Friend, why are you here? What a great question. We had a dear family friend of ours for, for many years, a fellow by the name of Wallace Chapel, and, and, and Dr. Chapel was what they called a conference evangelist. He, he preached not all over western North Carolina and all over the United States, but literally all over the world. He wrote several books, and one of those books was called All for Jesus. And in that book, he begins the first chapter by saying the essential question of the Christian faith 
is the question that Jesus asked of Judas. Friend, why are you here? And, and he said, Dr. Chapel said, when we can begin to answer that question, then we begin to grow in our faith. So I want us to spend just a moment today asking ourselves that question. Why are we here? Because if you'll notice in the garden, there were a lot of different groups of people there. There were those drowsy disciples. They were sleeping, weren't they? How many of you have ever known anybody to go to sleep in church? <laughs> you don't have to confess. You know, my first appointment, it was awesome because I was new at the preaching thing and and, and one of my churches, Cool Spring, we always had 70 people in church. We had 70 members, 70 people in church every Sunday morning. Did not matter. But every Sunday morning, there was a little boy and his mom who would sit on the front row, pulpit kind of like this, front row, and he would lay down in his mom's lap and go to sleep every Sunday morning. One Sunday... He must not have slept at all the night before because he started snoring. And he was snoring so loud that nobody was listening to anything that I said. They were trying to figure out who was snoring in church. <laughs> Sometimes I, I, I think we find ourselves answering that question with kind of drowsy discipleship. I'm not talking about falling asleep only physically but spiritually as well. Sometimes if you were to ask me what I was doing here in the life of the church, what I'm doing here in the life of my faith, I, I would tell you, well, I'm, I'm kind of tired right now. I'm going to let everybody else do the work for a while. Christ says if we follow Him, we take up that cross. We deny ourselves. No chance for drowsy discipleship there. You know, in every garden, in every church, I think we may answer that question the same way those disciples answered it with Jesus in the garden. Sleepers in the garden, there were those who would betray Jesus in the garden, weren't there? You know, you know, in my life and how I live my faith, and, and I say... You know, I betray Christ sometimes by what I do, but I also betray Christ by what I don't do. Judas betrayed Christ by a kiss on a cheek. But think, Peter is there in the garden as well, isn't he? And he denied Christ for what he didn't do, for standing up for him. Sometimes we may have to answer that question by saying, you know, we're not doing a lot in the faith. We deny Christ for what we do and for what we don't do. Friend, why are you here? What a great question. And, and then you, you look and coming into this story, coming into the garden, there's this mob. There are these people who were there on church's orders and there to arrest Jesus. Why? They don't really know. They're just simply got all caught up in the moment. And they're just following the crowd. Now, I know none of you have ever done that. You've never followed the crowd, have you? You always do things on your own, by yourself. You never succumb to any kind of pressure, do you? Friend, why are you here? I hope it's not just following the crowd. I hope that we're here because we all want to grow in the faith. Jamie and I, when we were at Duke, we used to go walking. We lived in Poplar Apartments. Those apartments were built probably in the 30s, and they, they still looked like it when we lived there in the 80s. But, but we would walk at night. And, and we had our own little route that we would walk around Poplar Apartments about a mile from Duke campus. As we would walk by this one apartment, there would be this dog looking out the window, just waiting to see what was going on. Every night we walked by, that dog would bark uncontrollably. Act like it's coming out of the window. Now I want you to know what happened. 
This apartment was here, this dog who saw us walking. As we walked around the rest of those apartments, everybody who had a dog, guess what happened? <laughs> they started barking. Only the first dog knew what he was barking at. Everybody else was just listening, following that bark. If we're disciples of Christ, just following the crowd, I'm not sure that that's the kind of discipleship Jesus demands. Christ demands a personal commitment. Friend, why are you here? You've got to love the question. But then also, in that garden, there were redeemers, weren't there? Jesus was there, the essential redeemer. But there were potential redeemers in those drowsy disciples, too. I think in every church we should preach redemption, not judgment. We should preach love, not hate. Every church. Friend, why are we here as a church so we can judge everybody or so we can love everybody? The church needs to answer that question as well. Why are we here? Jesus says, if you really want to be my disciple, you love as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you have what for one another? Love. Love for one another. Why are we here, church? We're here to love this community and to teach them of a God who loves them. Have you ever got something stuck in your mind that you just couldn't get rid of? You, you try to get rid of it, but then it keeps just hammering back in your mind, like, almost like a song. You, you know, I, I love country music, but, but I really don't like Achy Breaky Heart by Billy Ray Cyrus. But <laughs> the other day I was riding down the road and that song came on. And guess what? All day long I was singing, Don't Break My Heart. My, you know, it just was stuck in my mind. Uh, well, sometimes stuff just gets stuck in our minds and we don't know how to get rid of it. Well, I've been having that problem and so I want to give what's in this mind, this is scary, and I want to get it out and I'm going to give it to you and let you worry about it now. <laughs> you see, over the last couple of months, we've been talking about the church being relevant. And I've told you how I'm worried about the organized church. I'm worried because we're losing members by the thousands every week. I'm worried. And that literally has been on my mind. Now, I can blame a lot of different things on that. I can say, well, we're going through a tough time as a country economically. Uh, I can say that, that the church has been left behind by the technology and we're not keeping up with that. I can give all kinds of excuses. But you know what? I think if the church is going to be relevant, I think we need to answer the question, each and every day and each and every ministry that we have. What are we doing? Why are we here? I say that because this past week I was talking with a colleague of mine and a colleague said, what, what are you preaching on? And I said, well, you know, it's Palm Sunday. And he goes, oh yeah, are, are you doing anything special in church? I said, well, the kids will come down and wave the palm branches, but other than that, nothing special. He goes, yeah, we're not really doing anything special either. I started thinking about those words that I spoke to the, my friend, my colleague. You know what? If the preacher can't get excited about what's going on in the life of the church, if I'm not fired up Sunday in and Sunday out to proclaim a gospel of grace and love, you know what's wrong with the church? <laughs> it's 
It's in the leadership. We become relevant, my friends, when we answer the question, what are we doing here? I pray, I pray and I hope each and every day that Highlands United Methodist Church is relevant in this community. And I firmly believe it is. But it is relevant not because of your preacher. It's relevant because of the love that you show in this community. Friends, why are we here? I hope it's to spread a gospel of love and redemption. My Aunt Jean really wanted to know why I was there in Andrews. I really tried to tell her, but she never really believed me. She said, your mama made you come over here. <laughs> As we go out in this community, and as we share God's love and grace, I hope and I pray that people know that's genuine. God calls us to love. Friends, why are we here? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.